This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you and sponsored by Vikings. Vikings! Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. War of Clans. And please note that Vikings... Vikings! Yes, thank you, we get it. You're Vikings! Vikings! Well, what I'm trying to say is that these... Vikings! Thank you. Are not historically accurate, but rather fantasy interpretations, which I don't think you're going to complain about too much. Vikings! 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 Oh, fine. Vikings! War of Clans! Is that better? Yes. If you haven't tried this game before, it's a perfect time to start because a new version of it has just been released. Now available on mobile, you can also get it on tablet and PC, and you'll notice it resembles one of those classic strategy games of the 90s. Choose your own playstyle, destroy cities, build impregnable fortresses, or use diplomacy to rule the world. For myself, I've always preferred building impregnable bases in these kind of games. So if you have a spare five minutes, why not download this game via the link below for a few in-game goodies, specifically a free protection shield and a special bonus of 200 gold. You know, not, not, not real 200 gold, in-game currency gold, but 200! And find out why millions of people are so addicted to Vikings War of Clans. We approve. Thank you, you're welcome. Shadowverses. Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome back to my series where I take a look at the best historical medieval weapons for a certain fantasy creature, according to my own opinions. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at snake people. First of all, there are a lot of different kinds of snake people in fantasy. Uh, a very prominent name for them are nuggers. Uh, but uh, the issue with that is that they're, uh, like, depending on the fantasy, they're different. For instance, uh, in classic D&D, a nugga is simply a snake with a, a giant snake with a human head. And uh, so, so with that, you know, it changes. So I'm just going to say snake people. And for the purpose of this video specifically, this means uh, a giant snake that's also half human. So there's a human from torso up and it doesn't, they don't need to have a human face. They can still have a snake-like face, but as long as they have two hands, okay, and it's a snake body from waist down, that's the creature we're going to be looking at. I know there are some variants that have more than just two arms. Four is common for snake-like people, uh, but no, we're not going to be looking at the four-armed versions, just two-armed versions and indeed four-armed creatures. That, that's a topic for a whole nother video, which I will get to. Interestingly, there is kind of a semi-traditional weapon for this type of creature, not nearly as iconic or traditional as, say, the axe for the dwarf or the bow for the elf, but snake people are very, are very often depicted using long curved swords, scimitars, or swords from the scimitar family. Scimitar is an odd kind of bag of fish in regards to sword classification. But yes, scimitars and dual wielding also very common. The question is then, why are these weapons often uh, given to this type of creature? And I can't really think of any specific physical characteristics that would uh, give unique benefit to scimitar curved swords over many other types of weapons. In fact, uh, as I think about it, there are a couple of weapons that come to my mind a bit more prominently that suits the, this creature's physical characteristics over swords. So I can only really assume that uh, they're given to snake people because, uh, I don't know, a, a snake Snakes are often featured in uh, either uh, kind of Indian or Middle Eastern mythology. And so perhaps they give scimitars to the snake people because of the area that snakes are associated with, a cultural aspect perhaps. Well, let's throw kind of the culture side out of the window and just look specifically at the physical characteristics and what type of not only weapons but combat would best suit them. So one of the first things that I think uh, is often forgotten about snake people is uh, that they're half snakes. But uh, of course, you know, how do we forget that in terms of combat, right? You see that like when people are giving snake people weapons, they always seem to be just thinking about the human component. They got arms, so we'll give them swords. But they're half snake, more than half snake. They're technically just in take away weapons. A giant snake, okay? The actual snake body portion is far bigger than any real life snake in the world. This is just in and of itself a giant snake. And that there has some very significant implications. You see, snakes have a combative style that exists naturally already, all right? But without us needing to think out a lot, we can just look at nature. And it's constriction, okay? When uh, small snakes to even large anacondas that's their go-to technique, constriction. And so this begs the question as, well, 
If a snake person is far bigger than a normal snake, why on earth would they get rid of this technique? Why wouldn't they use it? In fact, this technique is scary, deadly, crazy scary, okay? If we look at the larger snakes in nature, an anaconda, the amount of force that an anaconda can produce in constriction is insane, all right? Looking up some of the statistics, they can produce 90 pounds of force per square inch, okay? That's 40 kilos. Combined together with the full, you know, force on every square inch of the body, that's like resting a bus on your chest, okay? But the force is distributed all around the body, but still, that is an insane amount of force. And this is for an anaconda, all right? So multiply that for a snake-like body, and the girth of the, you know, snake is about this big. Anaconda, yeah, you know, about, about, about yay big. That, like, think about the force that these snake people could produce in just constrictive power. That's crazy! The other crazy thing about this is that an anaconda is able to maintain this force from 15 to 20 minutes. Think about that, all right? Think about how much uh, force our muscles can produce and then hold, like just pick up, you know, some dumbbells or something like that and hold them out and using all your muscle strength to hold them there. See how long you can maintain that, all right? A snake, that's insane, 15 to 20 minutes. Maintaining their full muscle strength in tension, that, that's, in, that's it's crazy, right? <laughs> so that means that, that like just the muscle strength of a snake person in normal use, just from their arms, they could probably maintain like intense muscle exertion for a way longer period than humans could. Now the question is, would this type of constriction be a viable combat technique in fighting against, uh, say, human adventurers in a fantasy setting? Specifically, would it be more viable uh, and more effective than using actual weapons? Yes, I do believe so. If, uh, you know, the, the snake person has a means to protect itself to initiate the constriction. And this is what leads us into the first uh, important weapon that I think the snake would employ with its arms. And that is something defensive that would protect itself and enable it to close the distance very quickly to its opponents to then just slide around them and then wrap them up. And that would be a really big shield. So yeah, something like tower shield. Now just a note on the tower shield, because I also like to mention some of the more you know important, like uh, accurate information in regards to history and stuff. Tower shield is an ahistorical term. It doesn't exist in history, but I actually think it's perfectly fine to use because it communicates exactly what it needs to be. Now I know that the most direct historical equivalent to a tower shield is the Roman scutum. And if you want to look to the medieval period, you're probably looking at a pavis. And the Metatron actually, I think pointed out the proper pronunciation for it. A pave paveze? <laughs> Sorry mate, I'll probably butcher it again. I do that. But I actually think the term tower shield is a perfectly acceptable term to identify this family or type of shield. And then we can say the specific types of tower shields is paveze or pavis uh, and scutum. Yeah, so fine. So yeah, tower shield, no problem. I think it, yeah. Now if a snake person could initiate a constriction on an adventurer, they're screwed. I, I have no idea how they'd be able to uh, resist. Once they get wrapped up, they literally bound, okay? There is one thing that uh, I think the snake, you know, would want to protect itself with, and that, like, this is odd, right? When, you, when I've been looking up uh, artistic interpretations or depictions of the snake people, armor seems to be a scarce thing, and if they are wearing armor, it seems to be only on the upper body, which is odd, right? It, like, uh, in terms of going into the anatomy of snake people, I've only, I actually did see a picture of someone showing the anatomy and the, the heart did seem to be situated uh, where uh, the human heart would be. But, you know, with a snake, I think the, uh, like, for terms of pushing the right blood through, through through the whole body, I'm not sure a human heart would be able to do the job. I actually think the heart would probably be more logically uh, situated somewhere where the heart on a snake would be, which means that one of the, you know, sim at least one significant vital organ, if not more, is actually in the snake part of the body, not just the human part of the body, so that would want to be protected as well. So what type of armor would work really well with this snake type creature? Male, it's perfect. It, uh, male basically has complete flexibility, move, like, there's no restriction in it at all. And so with the snake, you know, slithering, moving around, even wrapping around people and stuff, male would not restrict that one bit. So I actually think a snake person would want to wear male all the way down its body. And if that was the case, even if someone got wrapped up, okay, and their arms are free, so they're wrapped up from body down from the snake person, they can try and hack or get in at the snake's body, 
And that's not going to do a thing because, interestingly, uh, like looking at anacondas, they can receive some, you know, almost lethal injuries uh, from animals and wrapping up. If they get wrapped around a horn and accidentally pierce themselves on the side or something like that, uh, that can spell death. For the, for the anaconda, but if, you know, this snake person was protected against that, male, and look, male can be thrust through, but with difficulty, and it's almost perfect protection against slashes, what could a person do if they get wrapped up like this? And then think of the extreme amount of force that can be applied, all right? I'm confident that such force would crush, you know, cave in armor, break bones, snap spines, let alone just suffocation. They'd just be crushed in this thing. Good, you're dead! You can't do a thing! So absolutely, I believe, constriction would be a very viable and oft-used technique by snake people. But is it a universally useful technique? No. Because there's one, you know, significant thing about this, te this style of fighting, right? It's mainly, you know, effective against one opponent. Uh, once you have more than one, you know, it gets difficult. Maybe you could wrap more than one in, you know. But, uh, oh. So if this snake person was fighting, uh, you know, more than one person, constriction might have to be a backup or reserve for when there's only one person left. There is also another very significant physical characteristic and ability that this creature would be able to have, okay, that we can also infer from looking at real life snakes. And that is their ability to just jump forward with crazy speed and attack, all right? So a snake will co coil its body, yeah, uh, you know, kind of like a spring, and then just leap forward. And the range in terms of its size that it's able to get, like it can leap forward in it, yeah, what, over, I was gonna say half its length, but it's, yeah, that's tricky with its body, but in comparison to a human of equivalent size, all right, the, the ability, like, the, the contrasting or equivalent that a human has is simply in a lunge. A human can lunge forward and try and strike, right? And we can get maybe the length of our own bodies in a full length lunge, maybe, uh, two meters if we're really trying to jump. But this snake creature, okay, half human, half snake, Gee, that, like, like with a full coil with the length of its body, I'm thinking it could reach six, seven meters. That's nuts, okay? Which means its, in, it's ability to engage in combat is at a way greater distance, way uh, than a human. And so they are in lethal striking range, but a human would be way out of range. Do you see this significant advantage in that? And so this creates two very co contrasting but specific styles of combat that a snake person would want to employ. One is crazy close combat with their constriction, wrapping up, grappling, their version of grappling, and then crazy long range distance, all right, uh, in terms of melee combat. We will get to range combat, but, but first, all right, focusing on melee. So that was the two types of combat. Extreme close range grappling, uh, you know, combat, and extreme long range uh, combat where it engages in with these crazy big lunges and the type of weapon that suits uh, this, you know, staying at a distance and then leaping forward with this crazy reach that it's able to make, you know, achieve. A spear suits this combat really, really well. Uh, now, in terms of spear variants, a lot like you could look at halberd and stuff like that, I think it wouldn't want a weapon that's too top heavy because the, the more heavy ended uh, pole arm, the more difficult it is to aim that point and you get less point control. And so I think having good point control would be very important in this lunge because you would want to pinpoint this spear strike. And so think about it. This would also mean that when it actually engages with their, their opponents, and I'm always placing them against humans, if they using a spear, they are still at a very safe distance from the opponent because they can use the spear's reach to get it, which would also increase, so maybe they could, like, th their ability to engage in combat could be up to maybe 10 meters from their opponent, which is insane! And would a human really be aware that the engaging potential of these snake people would be so extreme? I don't really think so, and, and the reason why I infer that is because when I've looked at other people, you know, just depicting snakes and other creatures, stuff like that, and in, in fantasy and video games, they kind of appear, you always see these creatures fighting at the regular human distance and they're really kind of uh, considered more with human fighting styles than uh, really taking advantage of their 
snake physical characteristics. Which just seems to imply to me that we as humans already have been regarding these creatures uh, too human-like already. And so when a human comes up against this creature, they probably are thinking, well, it's half human. That means I am going to be thinking human levels of distance to my opponent is still safe. And so the human will walk way far into the actual engageable distance that this snake creature can employ without realizing which would, and maybe they're, they're just like, they're not, they're, their guard isn't even fully up because they just want, you know, and they're thinking, what, I'm six, seven meters away, I'm still safe. And then bang! Remember how fast these things can move? Just leaps forward with this crazy fast attack that it can get such range with a spear through the chest, they're dead. And remember that other, you know, uh, weapon that was very useful to protect them if they were ever wanted to get close enough to do the, you know, constriction attack? Big shield, tower shield. So tower shield and spear is looking like a really good and deadly combo for these creatures. And even if it misses on the first strike, I think its ability to pull itself back because it has such a long body behind itself to try and re kind of coil its body for another spring would probably be pretty effective as well. So I imagine it could just like lash out and then just come right back in ready to attack again. And so these fast lightning quick attacks are just coming at their opponents without even realizing. And then before they can do anything, they're suddenly out of reach for the human people that they're fighting. Oh boy, this creature's deadly already. It's just funny, like with so many of the creatures that we've looked at, when we really look at the physical characteristics and stuff and how we find such deadly combative techniques that they could employ based on such different characteristics, Gosh, you wonder how humans survive in these worlds if they actually fought what I think they would if they really employed all their abilities at their disposal. There is another kind of ability on top of all these other things that a snake could really employ in which a spear becomes really, really useful. And that's that it can kind of keep itself at a distance but also at a much higher elevation as well. Because a snake can pull, push itself up based on its kind of snaky body and then hover Oh, how many meters, are, like a good several meters above the human. So think about like, you know, head, compare the head heights, the snake person could lift itself up way higher than the human, just kind of spoke down. And then could the human could like, especially the snake angles its body forward a bit like that, uh, depending on what the weapons the human has, but like say they have a sword or something, they wouldn't even be able to slash at their snake anything and then they got dealing with this spear and if they rush in to try and slash at the snake's body because the, the human body is above them, they can't reach, so they try and get the body, guess what they've done? They've put themselves in direct, you know, constricting range and the snake just has to wrap around them and then crush them to death. So those are three very significant physical abilities a snake would have. Constriction, uh, coil kind of leap lunging, you know, attacks as well, and being able to put itself at a much higher elevation. Now, I'm not saying I have a higher ground because I always win that, that's like, why would I? In, if you look at specifically that, it would be able to put the rest of its body out of range and then just poke down, that's where it would get its advantage, not just by inherently having high ground over someone else. Okay, yes, all right. Tower shield, spear, those are my picks. What about ranged weapons? Now, at first I was thinking ranged weapons wouldn't really have any significant difference over uh, a human using ranged weapon. In fact, the humans probably want to really use <laughs> ranged weapons against snake creatures. But then I remembered that very significant muscle characteristic snakes have, that they can maintain full tense, you know, they're, they're, they're tensing their muscles, full exertion for such a long period of time. And, and then I was saying, I feel that muscle characteristic would carry over to the whole body. That would uh, affect, uh, you know, a type of ranged weapon, bows specifically. And that is when you pull a bow back to full draw. We often rag on, you know, movie depictions of people just holding it back a bow willy nilly. And I mentioned this in my video, best uh, types of weapons for women. You know, there you go. And that the bow is generally considered a weapon more appropriate for people with less strength. Uh, and I talk about how difficult it is to hold a bow back at full draw, especially a war bow, okay? And uh, the average was uh, maxing up out at around 15 seconds, right? But a snake can apply pressure through their muscle structure 
pressure for up to 15 to 20 minutes. I mean, the snake would actually be able to hold a bow back at full draw for, for a really extended period of time. Now, is that a, a huge advantage? I don't think it's massive, okay? But it does mean that they perhaps could take their time and, and you zone in and aim uh, a bit better than, say, humans would, like, especially moving targets. If you're moving target uh, and yet, you know, trying to keep the bow steady and still while you're moving along, in those situations, you do need to hold the bow back at full draw for, uh, uh, you know, a bit of a longer period. And then you, when you're reaching your maximum, you have to let go because otherwise you'll, you'll, it won't work, will it? But yes, snake people, I feel would actually get that uh, just a bit of advantage in that regards that they could actually hold, you know, bows back at full draw, full muscle, you know, intense use for as long as they could with, uh, you know, applying their force in their constriction. So there you go. I don't think it's a game changer specifically. And I also don't think that uh, snake people have a specific environment that is, uh, you know, that's where they like, like, for instance, are they always in dungeons or are they monsters and stuff like that? No, when I look at uh, fantasies in general, snake people sometimes are given status of that, they have full empires, right? And then they're, they're, their environments are actually kind of equivalent-ish to humans and stuff. So I don't think that that would affect weapon choice specifically, which is what leads me to the choices that I have given. And I don't think that would be overly inclined to use ranged weapons over melee weapons, uh, depending on, say, a battlefield situation. In the battlefield, there's always like uh, mitigating circumstances which you would want to use ranged weapons for the sake of the battle, not physical characteristics of your army. But if one of the most effective weapons to be used against snake people were ranged weapons, that means they'll be putting themselves at a disadvantage by staying at range, but also in range of the opponents, which means they would want to close the distance and nullify the effectiveness of those, you know, archers and stuff. They got big shields if they're using the ones that I pick. And in fact, imagine a snake shield wall, right? You just see a, a line of shields, right? and if they have their bodies coiled, like one of these shields just suddenly leaps forward up to, you know, seven to ten meters with a big spear, and then they jumps back into the shield line and then these random shield with you know long uh, spears are just jumping out at different things lashing out of the enemy at like a way larger distance to the enemy shield line uh, so that's just an interesting thought of what it would be like in large scale combat I'll end this video off sharing some of my thoughts in regards to their venom the first question that needs to be asked is do these snakes have venom and I think it really depends on what type of head they have and it seems to be 50-50 half the time they have very human like heads and then other half the time they have very snake-like heads. In fact, it seems to be the gender that really determines this. If the snake is a female, they're made to be an attractive, you know, very human-like uh, body from the waist up. But if they're male, they seem to go more monstrous snake-like head. And who knows, maybe the female variants also have venom fangs as well. And if the snake does have venom, well, it really does depend on how lethal the venom is. And venom doesn't kill people instantly. It does take a bit of time, <laughs> depending on the type of snake. We have venomous snakes here in Australia that certainly uh, take effect quite fast, but that's like in a, a couple of minutes where people start to really feel the effects of the venom. But that definitely could be a viable combative move, especially if the snake has the shield, they can close the distance, use their constriction, wrap someone up and then bite. And depending on how strong the venom is, that can be game over. They can just slither away and let the person, uh, you know, die or go unconscious or whatever the venom does, and then they've won the fight, haven't they? So again, employing the venom is simply a matter of closing the distance and a big shield Shield certainly helps out in that regard. Uh, but boy, this was a fun one to consider. I, I, like creatures that are still slightly human-like, but different enough, more different than say elves or minotaurs or anything things like that, is when suddenly this consideration, this discussion, the best historical weapons for these creatures gets really interesting. Uh, we had a lot of fun like that with uh, the video on centaurs as well. And so yes, a lot of fun. Thanks for watching guys. I do hope you've enjoyed and I hope to see you again. Until that time, farewell.